thank you for coming and uh, joining us for today's discussion, which I think will be a very interesting one on subsidies to Chinese industry, uh, why they matter, and what we should do about it. And we're very pleased here in the Freeman Chair today to have uh, two very distinguished scholars uh, looking at this topic. You uh, probably have seen they've just published a book called uh, Subsidies to Chinese Industry, State Capitalism, Business Strategy, and Trade Policy that looks uh, very, very closely at this issue in several key sectors. Um, Dr. Usha Haley uh, has testified and presented on Chinese subsidies to the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, the U.S. Congress Committee on Ways and Means, the U.S. International Trade Commission, uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, and U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, her research on Chinese subsidies has supported regulation in the U.S. and in the EU. Her 200 publications and presentations include seven books and articles in California Management Review, the Harvard Business Review, and elsewhere. In 2012, she received the Academy of Management's uh, Practice Impact Award for scholarly impact. And in 2011, The Economist featured her as a thought leader on emerging markets. In 2003, the Literati Club gave her a Lifetime Achievement Award for contributions to understanding business in the Asia Pacific. And she has lived and worked on five continents and is currently Professor of Management and Director of Robbins Center for Global Business Strategy at West Virginia University. Dr. George Haley uh, has also testified and presented on Chinese subsidies and business to the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, the U.S. International Trade Commission, the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development, and the National Intelligence Council over at the CIA. Uh, he has over 125 publications and presentations, including two best-selling books on Asian business, a leading business textbook, and articles in the Harvard Business Review and Industrial Marketing Management. In 2010, AmericanMadeHeroes.com named him a hero advocate for his work with American manufacturers, and Industry Week identified him as a thought leader on manufacturing. In 2009, the American Marketing Association's Marketing News named him a marketing academic to watch based on research, teaching, and impact. And he has lived and worked also on five continents and is currently professor of marketing and international business at the University of New Haven and director of the Center for International Industry Competitiveness. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of the Dr. Haley's <laughs> who will uh, give a brief presentation and then we'll engage in a Q&A session. Please, welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Usha Haley. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm Usha, and this is George, and today we're going to be talking about subsidies to Chinese industry, why they matter, and what we should do. The research is from our book, Subsidies to Chinese Industry, published by Oxford University Press um, in April of this year. We think that, that subsidies, subsidies to Chinese industry are the game changer of this century and the most under-researched topic that we are confronting. In the last five years or so, we have seen China move from net, from net importer to the largest manufacturer and largest exporter in capital-intensive industries in which it enjoyed no comparative advantage just a decade ago. In the last five years or so, we have seen industrialized countries become primarily exporters of scrap and commodities to China, and we have watched the effects on business strategy and national competitive advantage. And in this talk today, I'm going to give you a little bit of what we found. Subsidies have not really been explored that thoroughly in economic theories. Economic theories have mostly concentrated on subsidies in industrialized countries, not really exploring their effects on emerging markets. And so there's a theoretical gap Economic theories have mostly portrayed manufacturing subsidies as distortive, redistributing and reallocating resources according to non-market criteria that result in economically inefficient allocations of these resources. When they have looked at certain emerging market industries, they have mostly looked at infant industries and so have not really seen or, or identified how subsidies could contribute to a country's comparative advantage and not just disadvantage. So for example, when they see China selling subsidized products, economists would say that is hurting China, but that it is helping consumers around the world because then they can buy this cheap product. But what they don't understand for the most part 
is that Chinese policy has its historical precedents not in these free market metaphors, but in Confucian metaphors, where individual utility subsumes in harmonious fashion to administrative utility. China's state capitalist regime views subsidies as conceptions of control. And what do I mean by that? Important ways in which China's businesses and governments produce meaning and stabilize markets. The flows of subsidies reflect interactions between critical Chinese actors, such as the provinces, the, the center, and the municipal governments. And all these all subsidies have generally been used to advance the governments and the CPCs, the Communist Party of China's political, social, economic, and diplomatic goals. And in the pursuit of these goals, the governments willingly pay the cost of economic inefficiency. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about capitalism with Chinese characteristics, move on to speak about our data and problems. I'll speak about subsidies to steel, glass, paper, and auto parts, talk a bit about the solar industry, and then finally answer some policy questions. And actually, I'd like to propose a few as well. State capitalism refers to a, a situation where states play significant and visible roles in markets. And there are two dimensions to state capitalism, the extent of the state's ownership of production and the extent of the state's coordination with other enterprises. And China uniquely synchronizes party, government, military, and economy. The state freely creates and maintains enterprises. It holds a majority of shareholdings. It controls critical personnel and makes decisions about their placement and it supplies capital to state-owned enterprises, or SOEs, whose managers are ultimately responsible to the state and not to their shareholders. Control of capital is extremely important in, these, in, these, um, in the system. But, for example, the Chinese uh, central and provincial governments direct all major financial institutions, and the state council's vice premier controls all the major banks. So flows of capital, that is, who is loaning money to whom, is extremely important but very poorly understood. And this is because there are very few industry studies that have existed and because of the complexity and opacity of Chinese borrowing and lending. China, of course, is also not just a homogeneous country. It's a multi-organizational state where there are semi-independent, semi-autonomous organizational sets at both the central, the provincial, and the municipal level, all of whom have their own interests, some of which clash. That's what I'm going to be talking about in just a little bit. Here's, an, here's a graph of fixed asset investment as a percentage of GDP in China. And it has grown from about 24% of GDP to about 66% of GDP in 2009. Here's another one of the ratio of private to government consumption in China. Private consumption has been rising in China, but government consumption has been rising even faster. So the power of the state is expanding. The data do not show a gradualist approach of the state retreating and private enterprise advancing. We did a, a few studies to look at these flows of capital. These were industry studies. We looked at subsidies to steel, glass, paper, auto parts, and solar PV. All of these were capital-intensive industries where labor was between 2 and 7% of total costs. Now, I'm not talking about global costs. I'm also talking about costs in China. They were fragmented industries with no economies of scale or scope. That is, the largest company, there was a low concentration ratio, as economists would say. The largest companies held a small percentage of the market, just only about 20% or so. Most of the companies were small, as I said, but they were also geographically dispersed. Every province, it seems, wanted one of these industries and had them. They had no technological advantage. And the prices were still 25 to 30 percent lower than the U.S. or EU. We looked at subsidies that we could calculate and that we could obtain. And very frankly, that is the tip of the iceberg. 
because we couldn't get data for most of, the, most of the subsidies that we knew existed. Now there are many anecdotal stories about subsidies. We even found data for subsidies that we could not verify from other sources, and so we discarded it. Our data are literally, as I said, the tip of the iceberg. We looked at free or low cost loans, subsidies to energy, including electricity, thermal and coking coal and natural gas, and subsidies to inputs such as soda, ash, pulp, recycled paper, glass, coal rolled steel, as well as subsidies to land where land was given for free, for example, and to technology, which is primarily the acquisition of technology or the development of technology. Our data, we'd be the first to say, has several problems. Among them, the institutional limitations of obtaining these kind of data in China. Another was the lack of rigorous surveys. Also, the opaque and contradictory accounting data. For example, so many of these transactions dealt with SOEs and transactions within and between SOEs. So re related party transactions, though, are extremely complex when you, in China and have never been reported. Therefore, we use data from governments, not just the Chinese government, but other governments around the world, and our data were from around the world, from companies, from NGOs, investment houses, in industry associations. We cross-checked and discarded data, so when we could not get data from more than one source, we did not use it. Let me talk a little bit about the steel industry. Steel is a pillar industry in China, and foreign investment is strictly speaking not allowed. In 2013, China is the largest producer and consumer of steel. It has about 50% of production, up from 16% in 1999. In 2005, China is, went from a net steel importer to, to a steel exporter. The next year, it became the largest steel exporter. In 2007, China became the largest steel producer. Steel making capacity more than doubled from 2005 to 2012 and is continuing to grow. From 2000 to 2006, energy subsidies grew by 1,365%. And all we looked at here is energy subsidies for the steel industry. Total energy subsidies from 2000 to mid-2007 were about $27 billion. Remember that China joined the WTO in 2001. So these changes were almost overnight, the blink of an eye almost. The central government has often called for consolidation of the steel industry because China, for the most part, is a price taker when it comes to steel rather than a price maker. But, ev but the, here, the will of the center is thwarted by the desires of the province. Every single province has a steel industry, as you can see, the dispersion of the... Uh, and so there are no economies of scale or scope. Here you look at energy subsidies from 2000 to, to, to mid-2007. And they are about 27 billion in total, just energy subsidies. And across all, all of what we studied, coking coal, thermal coal, electricity, and natural gas, these subsidies increased. Energy subsidies also correlated with steel production in China and steel exports, both global exports from China to the rest of the world and, of course, exports to the United States. What are some of the effects of these subsidies? Massive excess capacity in China, with supply exceeding demand on average by 20% every year. More capacity, though, is added in China every year than the total production capacity of the second largest producer of steel, Japan. <laughs> From 2000 to 2012, the United States has had a trade deficit with China on every year except one. In 2012, the U.S. trade deficit was 142% greater than in 2000. Despite all the limitations we spoke about, Chinese steel still sells for between 20 to 30% less than U.S. or EU steel, setting prices worldwide. And from 2009, the U.S. and EU have filed numerous trade you know, complaints against China. Let me talk about another industry very briefly, the glass industry. China is the largest producer and consumer of glass in the world. It has the largest number of glass enterprises. And since 2003, production has doubled, 
and production capacity has doubled, and it has tripled since 2000. Okay. We looked at um, a variety of indicators for subsidies here, not just energy, and we found a total of about 30.3 30 billion from 2004 to 2008. Again, as I said, the tip of the iceberg. There is much excess capacity in Chinese glass, but more capacity, again, is added annually. What we saw was that the ratio of subsidies to gross industrial output was rising. That is the percentage of subsidies that could be accounted for was rising. From about 2004 to 2008, it was, it, what, we, what we studied, and in about 2008, it was about 35% of gross industrial output. I think part of the reason for that is that there's a saturation of capital in the Chinese markets, in Chinese production. So every dollar of subsidy is getting a, a smaller and smaller return. And of course, another effect was the trade disparity in glass between the, in, <laughs> between the US and China. Although US exports to China and to, uh, in glass have been rising, US imports from China on glass have been rising at a much faster rate, contributing to a growing trade deficit. Now let's look at paper, a really interesting industry. 88% of companies in this industry, in this Chinese industry, are small companies, by any standard, very small. China has no comparative advantage in the production of paper. It has one of the smallest per capita forests, forestry in the, forests in the world. <laughs> it imports most of its inputs. So for example, 35% of the costs of, making produ of producing paper in China come from pulp. China imports all its pulp. Labor is only 4% of the cost of manufacturing paper in China or elsewhere. Yet, in 2008, China overtook the United States to become the largest paper producer in the world. In 2009, it produced 17% of world paper. We estimate that between 2002 to 2009, there were at least 33 billion in subsidies given to the paper industry. Despite all this excess capacity, about 26% of capacity on average has been added to the Chinese glass industry annually. And again, the same story on the trade deficit. Although U.S. exports have been rising, U.S. imports have been rising at a much faster rate, and so a huge growing trade deficit. Now let's look at the auto industry briefly. Autos is an interesting industry because I do think the Chinese subsidies have had a beneficial effect here for their industry. Autos is a pillar industry for the center and also for 24 provinces. China, as you know, is the largest car market in the world, but autos, auto parts, makes up 70% of the costs of an auto, so they're very important. China is one of the largest auto parts producers in the world, and exports to the United States are about a third of its production. Chinese policy is focused on the acquisition and development of new energy and green technologies. Again, the industry is highly fragmented, with 10,000 registered and at least 15,000 unregistered manufacturers. From 2000 to 2011, we, saw, we found that about 28 billion in subsidies was given, with about 11 billion given for restructuring and technology development over the next decade. Here is a graph on the growth of China's auto parts industry. It's grown about 150% since 2003. Interestingly, on Chinese exports and imports of auto parts, it is a net importer of auto parts from all the auto manufacturing countries except the United States. The United States is a notable exception, and that is because of the way the U.S. companies have structured their supply chain to where they manufacture in China and export back to the United States. And here again is the perennial story of trade disparity between China and the United States with the widening trade imbalance. 
As I said, between 2000 and 2011, we found about 28 billion in subsidies with another 11 billion year marked for technology development over the next decade. What are some of the effects? Well, fixed investment has been rising, but output value for Chinese auto parts has been rising even faster. So they've had some benefits here with subsidies. There have been uh, technology transfer issues because of China's indigenous innovation policy, which means that if you want to manufacture in China or, ex or uh, in some way access their markets, you have to transfer your technology. There have been trade issues with the United States, including on branding, uh, the WTO and tariffs and new energy vehicles. And there have been provincial disputes where provinces, because of this enormous supply of auto parts, have created barriers for having for other provinces to access their market. And these have included local brands and local subsidy regulations to where they discriminate against other provinces. I want to talk very briefly about the solar industry. The solar industry in China has grown tenfold between 2008 and 2012. To, the solar industry, of course, owes its origins to the United States. The United States invented the solar industry and for a long, for, for a long time was the dominant manufacturer in that industry. Today, 80% of all solar panels are manufactured in China and prices have fallen 75% between 2008 and 2012. There are major differences in manufacturing style. While US private investors have encouraged technology differentiation and concentrated on innovative thin film PV technologies, the Chinese government has emphasized mature technologies, wafer silicon technologies in particular, which have allowed them to provide, to scale up and increase wages and employment and exports. Because of the scale of Chinese manufacturing, what the Chinese anoint then becomes the dominant technology. And so this older wafer silicon technology now has about 85% of the global market. Okay. If you look at it on a level playing field, China's cost advantage is less than 4% of that of the US. And these cost advantages mean nothing because you also have to factor in the costs of doing business in China. There's a top line and a bottom line cost. But when you start factoring in some of the known subsidies, China has an 18 to 20% core cost advantage, at least. Let's go a little further. When you start looking at the, man, at the shipping costs, well, China actually has a cost disadvantage of at least 5%. So how then could China sell or at 75% below what the other people were selling? Well, we started looking at some companies close up, and we found that a lot of borrowing was going on. <laughs> there were a lot of loans in the mix, and we looked in 2000, 2011 at LDK, SunTech, Yingli, SunPower, and the other major Chinese companies. Since we looked at them, we now know, of course, that SunTech, Wuxi SunTech, has declared bankruptcy and then was bailed out by the province that supported it, Wuxi. LDK China is um, precarious but all the others are also heavily in debt. What we found out is that without subsidies, they would all be bankrupt. The capacity expansion of Chinese and uh, US solar PV companies is also starkly contrasted here. If you see the, how the US companies have grown and how the Chinese companies have grown, as I said, the, there's been a tenfold expansion in China between 2008 and 2010 alone. and the inevitable supply-demand imbalance. When we did the study about a year ago, we found a 45% supply-demand imbalance. And I just rechecked the figures earlier this year, and that imbalance has changed. Now the estimated global demand is about 30 gigawatts, and the estimated global production, almost all of it from China, is about 60 gigawatts. So the supply-demand imbalance is 100%. Despite being the largest producer of solar panels in the world, China is one of the laggards when it comes to installing solar panels. So solar panels, China has less than 1% of the global installations in solar panels, despite highly publicized projects such as Golden Sun. 
It is moving in the right direction though, but so incrementally, so slowly, that these changes don't really matter much in, in, um, when it comes to proportion. And again, <laughs> here's the story. US trade with China on solar cells and modules. The increasing trade gap. There are interesting implications, not just on trade, but also for what kind of technologies will then become the global standard, where these technologies will be manufactured, and who pays the price where. For example, what we found is that these technologies were mostly developed in the United States, were then ramped up to scale in Germany, and then brought out by China. There are some very interesting policy questions here. The United States, of course, won this, um, this case against the Chinese solar panel manufacturers. And how have these duties affected imports, employment, or manufacturing in US solar? These same lessons are now being debated and mulled over in the European Union, which is also one a case. And what are the lessons for EU solar? What incentivizes Chinese production and exports? What is it that's driving this? And how do US policies affect Chinese provincial production, not just the center? Finally, how can globalized supply chains be addressed? Thank you. Half an hour? Thanks. Okay, well, a lot to chew on there. <laughs> and uh, we're going to go ahead and take some questions. As is usually our policy here at CSIS, please identify yourself and wait for the microphone uh, to get to you. The floor is open. Right up front here. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> um, hi, Paul Eckert of Reuters News Agency here in Washington. I'm familiar with your work. Haven't read the book yet. Look forward to doing so. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, two, two, two questions you sort of Close with questions. Uh, how can they, we have an opportunity uh, with the strategic and economic dialogue coming up in about a month's time here in Washington, and more broadly, the sense that under Xi Jinping, the new leadership, there's a, more scrutiny of uh, public expenditures, more respect, potentially more, more scrutiny of SOEs, and more potential respect for market principles. Do you see that as a possibility for? addressing some of these problems that uh, the U.S. has with China, one, and more broadly, is this, how does this differ from, say, Japan and Korea's approach of also uh, sort of circumventing comparative advantage and building up their economies 20, 30 years ago? Is it, does it differ only in scale, or is there much more heavy-handed state element here? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, you first said, could we, could we deal with this in the strategic and economic dialogue? Uh, probably not, because the Chinese have said that they don't subsidize any industries. That is their official position. The second is that they have not released any official subsidies in any of their disclosures since they joined the WTO. They're supposed to have done so every year. They've done so only once since they joined in 2001. And that only to foreign invested enterprises. The United States has approached them to continue to provide, to disclose their subsidies, and they have not done so. So this is going to be a little difficult. It's like telling the, for example, we have evidence that China is engaging in, in uh, cyber, uh, cyber attacks in the United States, and Xi Jinping said, no, they're not. <laughs> so what do you do in that situation? I think probably at a lower level, where you talk about just draw a line, just draw a fine line, the Chinese do respond when, and, and George may talk a little bit more about this, the Chinese don't depend that much on profits. They look at revenues. Can you talk a little bit about this, George? How do you turn this? Okay. okay what, what do you, when, you, when you look at Chinese business, and you look at especially the state-owned enterprises, they are not rewarded. Management is not rewarded for profitability. Management is rewarded for maximizing revenues. Profitability is irrelevant. So uh, that, that's one key issue that, that really uh, it is very distressing, I think, you'll find to American manufacturers. If you don't need to make profits as a manufacturer, then how can they or anyone else compete? The, the other thing that you might want to also consider is go back 10 years to when President Hu and Premier Wen came in. Very much the same was being said about them, and nothing really happened. So I think when you, when you start talking about President Xi and, and his crew, you need to look at it in a historical perspective. 
which will then create a significant degree of doubt as to whether any change will really take place. And your second question, I'm sorry. <laughs> what are the differences between the, the earlier sort of export-led growth? Oh, yeah. Well, size matters. Si of course. The Chinese economy is the second largest in the world. It, it matters. There is, and I've always said that China is a superpower. Forget talking about when it's going to become one. It is a superpower. So it's, it's just a scale. The United States also subsidized in its early days, and it also stole technology, but it was a small, minor power. China is not. I think another thing that you might also want to look at and consider is the fact that everyone's talking about how bad uh, condition the, the solar energy, energy uh, industry is in China. The steel industry today is, is just as badly off. So if you look at these industries, they're all losing money. Tilton, up here in the front. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So what do you think is the ultimate goal? I mean, if in fact these continue to subsidize to bring all the manufacturing to China, I mean, they basically put the U.S. solar industry out of business by operating and building at a loss on each panel that they build. Um, we know that steel, the same thing at this moment, uh, you put people back to work in the country, you, you create an overall economic buoyancy through uh, basically spending in China with people working. But what do you think the absolute goal is, and when do you think it reverses and prices just go up for everybody? That's very good questions. China is an emerging market. It's a very special emerging market. It's one where and emerging markets generally are those where political considerations are far more important than economic ones. So for China, it's not simply making profits worldwide. It's dominating certain industries worldwide. When they went into the auto industry, they said openly in a policy that we need an auto industry. We will dominate that auto industry because every major country has, has one. Every world power has one. It wants to dominate these industries. After that, uh, George is an expert on the Chinese civilization. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think they, they want to do after they dominate? I think they'll raise prices. I, I, think, I, I can't think of any monopolies that have kept prices low. They, they will raise prices, but if you, if you go back into Chinese history and, and the history of the West, you'll find the Emperor Tiberius uh, quoted as complaining about Rome's trade deficit with China. <laughs> and, and they have long memories, the Chinese do, so <laughs> bring up that one. <laughs> and China, whatever it is, it still views, themse views itself as the Middle Kingdom. As the, as the center, basically, of the universe. And they want to return to that status, where they are the center, at least, of this little corner of the universe on, on the planet Earth. Uh, they want to be the, the wealthiest power. They want to be the richest power. They want to be the greatest power. But at some point, there, there comes a point of diminishing returns where you basically invest it. And they're making money off of that. Those subsidies are turning into investment proceeds. That's why they have a three trillion dollar surplus. But is it to make certain that manufacturing dies in America to make It's not money making for the companies. So for the government, what you, what you need to look at uh, and, and consider when you talk about the Chinese government, those trade surpluses uh, are being used. They're being used uh, in order to, to gain influence overseas. If you look at a comparison, for instance, between the amount of, uh, of loans granted just to Latin America between the United States and, chi and China over the past, uh, I believe it was uh, 10 years, the uh, U.S. had loans to Latin America of uh, something over $2 billion. China had loans to Latin America of something over $30 billion. They have, uh, they're buying their way into a major position with countries around the world. They have identified Africa, for instance, as a region of the world where they, will, they want to absolutely dominate the trade uh, Africa has and also the investment into Africa and uh, the, 
Um, manufacturing and production of goods in Africa also. So that's what they're doing with it. They're, they are buying their way into other countries and, and influencing other countries. Um, an example of what they're doing, uh, if you look at um, Australia and China, uh, in the, uh, China has been a major purchaser of, of Australian minerals, iron ores, coal, everything that comes out of the ground. Uh, when Australia agreed to allow a small base be put into, I think it was Darwin on, in northern Australia, by, uh, by the U.S., they immediately started cutting back on their purchases of Australian minerals. And, and they, they were quite open and honest about telling the Australians they didn't like an American base in northern Australia, and that is why it was being cut back. Now, because of the drop in the, the, the falling uh, growth in the Chinese economy, they have now uh, indicated they were going to try and implement a policy where they no longer uh, imported coal from, especially low-quality coal, from any place in the world. Uh, so it's interesting to, to see what's going to happen to the Australian economy. Um, it was estimated at one time that $3,000 per capita uh, of income, of, of per capita income, in Australia is due solely to, uh, to Chinese uh, purchases of Australian minerals and investment in the mining operations in, in Australia. Um, the first developed economy to have a free trade agreement with, with China uh, was New Zealand. And New Zealand is in some, has some very serious problems today. Uh, they have a very high currency. They have high, uh, very high unemployment. and. Um, they have a, if you if you check out New Zealanders, just common New Zealanders, and, and check their feelings towards China, it is extremely negative towards China today. But just uh, look at the last year. Last year, China overtook the United States to become the world's largest trading nation. It is the number one trading partner for Brazil. It is the number one trading partner for India. It has overtaken. A, so you, you look at the power that you, China exercises around the world. It is a world power. Yeah. <laughs> Matt Goodman in the back. Hi, Matt Goodman. Is that on? Matt Goodman with CSIS. Um, I just just a comment on, on on this part of this conversation. I mean, you know, Chris is the one who tells me what the motives of of uh, China are in their foreign policy, so I don't know anything about that. But this pattern of um, a behavior that you described here, as an economist, I describe it, it looks to me like a country that's trying to get rich quick. So I think that could be the motivation is just to, you know, to get some economic growth uh, quickly. So I, I'm not quite as convinced by the presentation that this is, you know, part of a, um, a plot to take over the world um, or the region. But the question I wanted to ask, first I want to press you on the Korea-Japan thing just to, to further answer Paul's question. Did you do any comparative study of countries like Japan, which in some of these sectors um, did provide subsidies to their the industries to see not, not just the impact in terms of China being bigger, which I think is the way you answer the question, but in terms of um, what the actual uh, contribution of subsidies to Japan and China's growth in the steel and other sectors what, was. And then I guess sort of a related question finally is, um, did you do any sort of control group study of other sectors of the Chinese economy that have been successful without subsidies um, to see whether there were other factors that might have contributed? And they did, I just want to give a shout out to them for subsidizing, uh, for subsidizing, <laughs> which they did. They actually did subsidize us. But they also funded, they, they funded our, our research and we told them initially that we would do, they, they funded some of our research, not all of it, but some of it. And we told them we would do the steel study. This was five years ago and I, I had, we worked in China, we have researched China, we thought we understood Chinese data. We thought we could give them subsidies in three months. It took us one year to get subsidies, just energy subsidies for the steel industry. This pattern was repeated in every industry that we looked at, okay? So it was very time consuming for us. We got bug-eyed, we got tired, <laughs> we got old, as these things. We didn't do any comparative studies across. This by itself, this is, this is one of the few longitudinal industry studies of capital flows in China. In that it is unique. Perhaps later on, I could do something comparative, or George could do, but not currently. This took a long time, five years. It's a pretty long time. 
The second thing he said is China just wants to get rich fast. I don't think that contradicts what we are saying. What it, want, what it wants to do with its money is something else. If you look at the Gini index in China as an economist, I mean the disparity between the poorest people in China and the richest people is growing. The only other country with that kind of Gini index is the United States. So the poor people in China are not really benefiting. I mean, there are some who are, but most are not. I, I wonder, I mean, if you look at other patterns, of course it really depends on what you're looking at. But I think we can make a case for China wanting to become a world power and dominating some industries. It also wants to get rich. And some people in particular want to get rich as well. The uh, uh, young lady here in the corner. Thank you. My name is Jing. I'm with Baker Hosteller. We usually represent uh, former respondents in CVD cases. But here, I'm not representing anyone, just my own opinion. Um, first is a suggestion. Uh, I think Tianqing Pipe, who was named as a respondent in the oil country tubular goods, has set up a plant in Texas. So maybe a few years down the road, you can do a comparative study about how they operate in the US with you know, how they operate in China. And uh, my question is related to your last slide about the policy implication. I remember in 2009, President Obama and President Hu Jintao had a summit about green technology. But nowadays, a lot of trade cases are against green technology. So I'm wondering, what's your recommendation to US policymakers in this in ongoing dialogue? Thank you. Extremely complex questions, and I have 30 seconds to answer them, right? Yeah, as much time as you like. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't really, you know, I've, look, this is a very comp, it depends on from issue to issue. Every time we build a smart, smarter mouse trap, they have a smarter mouse. And then there is also, I, I tend to get the feeling that there's a lot of greed behind some of these decisions as well. It's not all the Chinese. It's, American companies that want to get rich fast and think they can go there and start and manufacture and not give up their technology. So it's, there's, these are, this is a very complex issue. I don't think all of, many emerging markets in, and many markets that were developing, such as the United States, also steal technology. George, well, George has written on this. IP theft is not unique. What is unique here is the scale of this theft, the scale of the changes that is occurring and the changes that we're talking about in industry have occurred in 10 years without giving any chance for restructuring, without giving any chance for any kind of equilibrium to take place, and just skewing all comparative advantage arguments. China does not have a comparative advantage in these industries in which it is dominating. So this is, this is one, of the, one of the issues that we're looking at. That issue that you brought up, it's very complex. It would depend on the technology. It would depend on the companies involved. It would depend on what kind of firewalls can be put up and where, how they structure their, their supply chains. I'm sorry, that's, that's, but thank you for your suggestion. Uh, in the middle here. Uh, Dan Lieberman, I'm a writer. Yeah, when uh, China first started developing in uh, 1979, uh, all of the Western economies were fully developed. So they were entering really at a tremendous disadvantage. Uh, we're trying to compare their development with what they should do today with what the Western powers are doing, but I wonder if we shouldn't compare what the United States and Britain did back in the 1800s. In other words, it's obvious that they had to do something extra to overcome the disadvantages that they were entering. And the second thing is we just keep always criticizing China, but since 1979, they've not only grown, but they've had practically no recessions. It was one minor one in the 1990s. They haven't had, you know, the cycles that the Western countries have had, and we've had it even before China developed. We had 1980, 1990, 2000. So why are we always criticizing China? It sounds like all we're saying is, we don't want you to be successful. We want you to be like us. You, you answer the one on the cycles. We don't know very much as to what's happening in China. For example, some of the data that we get, we, there is excess supply in China, which is not being sopped up. We hear about it much later, 
The data that we get on China are not accurate. They are not timely. Many of the industrial, industrial sectors are not transparent. So when we make, when we say that, ch that China has never been in a recession and everyone is doing fine, we don't really know what we're talking about for the most part. And there is statistically, I mean, the statistical information is controlled very tightly. When we were asking for just clarification of some accounting terms, that was against the law? <laughs> Did you know that? We couldn't get clarification on accounting terms? So the, this is hardly a place where what you see is what you get. But, but you want Okay. To As to the first part of your question about uh, about the development. If you look at China's development policies, starting in 1979 under Deng, they had one set of policies to develop, which was a policy of developing the entire nation. So if you looked at China at that point in time and saw their growth, they were growing throughout China. The western provinces were growing, economically speaking. People were coming to be better off. Then in the 1990s, Chinese development policy changed. They changed from a policy of uh, of trying to develop and increase the revenues and income of the, fa uh, the country as a whole to a policy of rapid urbanization. And all the growth went to the, went to the east, uh, to the cities on the coast. If you look at the great majority of provinces in China, since the 1990s, mostly their income has fallen. They have gotten poorer. Now, as far as the history goes, if you look at China's development policies, especially the early ones, the early uh, in the in the uh, 80s, what you see is that those were those were lifted directly from the U.S. playbook. You're right; we did do very much the same in the United States. The only thing that was different, really, the mate there's two major things that were different in the United States. We didn't have government ownership of companies and the means of production as they do in China, and in the United States, we had the official government policy of technology theft. You go to Alexander Hamilton's first report on manufacturers to Congress, and he specifies the success of, of American government's uh, intellectual property rights theft. Now, the Chinese have stolen a lot of technology, but it was never their official policy. <laughs> Over here. Uh, oh, sorry. You know? They have some of the best laws on the books, by the way, the Chinese do. Yes, it's the, the implementation that's the problem. Uh, another, another issue with China and this is uh, this is one thing where it's a, a lack of understanding on Westerners' part. If you, I mean, if I go back and I think through all the history classes I ever had on uh, that, that brought the Chinese in, it was always represented as a country where every single thing was controlled by the center, and it ne almost never has been. And uh, you find that the provincial governments have greater power and authority and autonomy of the central government in China than our American states do back uh, in the United States. And so that's one of the things that we have to recognize and understand about how to deal with the Chinese and in Chinese policymakers. Um, they have very good intellectual property rights laws, more strict and better than, the, than American laws, but implementation is entirely up to the provinces. So you had enforcement is by the provinces, and if they choose to enforce or they don't choose to enforce, that's the central authority has no power to, to force it. The Chinese have a saying, the hills are high and the emperor is far away. This is a weak center, strong provinces. Diana Negroponte, the Brookings Institution. Dr. George Haley, you have in part answered my question, which is going to be directed at Christopher Johnson. What is the balance and the dynamic between the provinces and the center? As we saw the multiplicity of steel production, glass production, in provinces on clearly an uneconomic basis, what's the political dynamic? Uh, this is a problem that's been going on primarily uh, since Deng initiated reform in the 1980s. Uh, at that time, they had uh, the process of the emergence of the reform policies and then tremendous decentralization within the system, especially after the Tiananmen period, as the conservative uh, leadership within Beijing kind of took control of the key bureaucracies, the key planning bureaucracies. So as Deng Xiaoping tried to restart reform, they had to do a lot of decentralization. This has now gone out of control, as George was just saying. And the provinces now have tremendous power to be able to push back on central directives. There have been some indications that Xi Jinping, the new 
new Chinese leader is attempting to re-centralize control. And you can see this in some of the policies he's been pursuing and in some personnel appointments that appear designed to re-centralize control back at the center. This is a long-standing problem, though, within their system. And it has to do a lot as well with the sort of steady but progressive degener degeneration of the Leninist system within China, right, in, in a world that is moving very, very quickly. So it's a perennial problem. The, the center is always trying to gain greater control. I think the thing that we have to focus on going forward is they claim that they're going to launch a fairly robust reform program this fall at the, at the third plenum. In order to do the kind of reforms that they're talking about, and it touches on a lot of these things we've been talking about today, they're going to first have to re-centralize control. And whether or not they're able to do that in, in a collective leadership where these uh, local provinces, especially the local provincial power brokers, look at the case, for example, uh, last year of Bo Xi Lai, who was basically running an independent barony, uh, it became quite clear. And a lot of the provinces operate that way. So it's a tremendous challenge for the center. Over here. Hi, Charles Katibi at uh, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Um, I was going to ask you, I mean, you said it yourself that just how unsustainable this entire system is. I mean, you said that like 20% of the steel industry is at overcapacity. If it's so unsustainable, is there a need for the US or Western powers to try to work aggressively to uh, hinder uh, these policies? Because if they say they gain a monopoly, over industrial goods, theoretically, that came with lower prices, wouldn't that monopoly just disappear later as soon as they decided to raise those prices? Can I answer that just a little bit? You're assuming no time lag. These are industries with very high um, fixed asset investments, and there is a development curve for the technology as well. There is always a time lag. Once you lose that industry, it takes time to get back, even with something like rare earths. The second, the second thing is, what exactly can we do other than hurt them with their pocketbook? That will get their attention. And we have to do something, because it's not that they can't do anything, it's just not their priority. I often think it's sort of, I don't know if any of you are old enough to have remembered the, um, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. <laughs> this was some, the Sorcerer's Apprentice from Fantasia. This was something that brought about growth. It was an easy fix for unemployment. It's gotten out of control. And they're really, it, it isn't really benefiting the Chinese economy. They've just done a state, an audit of the state finances. If you look at about a, this, this last week, shockingly about 36% of the, of the loans are off the book. <laughs> they, don't even, they, don't, they don't know where they're coming from. So they don't know how much in debt the states are, the provinces are. There is a real lack of codified knowledge of, 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 how, the, of how the borrowing is working. Sorry. Did you have anything on that, George? I, I just, would, I just would, would want to point out and reemphasize, once you lose an industry, it's going to take quite a bit before you can actually build up any kind of economies of scale to be able to challenge a dominant industry whether, uh, if it's foreign. Uh, and uh, any kind of uh, attempt to, to bring that industry back within one country or so can bring about just the, the predatory pricing and predatory uh, strategies to drive that industry back down under the earth and continue to dominate throughout. So if you, if you have uh, sales throughout the world, then you can afford the losses in one country or two countries, regardless of how large those countries are, in order to keep them from bringing their industry back. David? Uh, hi, uh, David Parker from CSIS. I just had a question about the, um, you talk about such an array of subsidies that are being awarded here. Could you talk a little bit about some of the mechanisms by which they're actually awarded and distributed, how they actually go about doing this at the different levels or in the different industries? Thank you. Okay. Easy answer is buy our book. It's there in <laughs> chapter two. <laughs> but a more complicated, it really depends. Uh, for example, with loans, they're just given by banks and other instruments. They have specialized instruments. Again, we didn't find everything, just what was reported here and there. With electricity, we were 
grossly underestimated because we relied on two circulars that were distributed by the provinces. Electricity pricing is very, very complex in China. I hate hate to keep bringing up the word complex, but that is the truth. So we relied on a couple of things. We also relied on a couple of pronouncements made by the center where they subsidized coal when coal prices went up. And coal was one of the dominant um, ways of generating electricity in China. For land, we looked at free land that was given, you know, the free, um, where it was, the, the land was just discounted, saplings were given for free, and then for the uh, pulp and manufacture of pulp and paper. We looked at price gap, which is the difference between world prices and the Chinese prices, as reported by the companies who were buying some of these commodities. So various, a hodgepodge of methods. But I'd be happy to talk about this later. It's a technical question. Right here in the middle toward the back. Yeah, my name is uh, Pat Malloy. I'm a trade lawyer, but I was a member of the China Commission for a number of years. And no one is hostile to the Chinese. They had a bad 200 years, and they were taken apart by the Western powers, and they want to rebuild. I first went to China in 1981. I saw a very poor country. But the problem, as I see it, is they use a term called comprehensive national power, meaning you build your economic and technological base, and upon that you will grow your military and your political strength. Our problem, the way I look at it, and the economist spoke over here, when you look at the formula for GDP growth, net exports, when they're minus, detract from jobs and GDP growth in your country. And they add when you're running a plus. China's running major pluses, and ours are in great debt year after year. And young people wonder why they're living in their parents' basements instead of having jobs. This is all part of it. And no one's uh, anti-Chinese to say they have a strategy. And we don't have any counter strategy. There's a famous book by Ralph Gomery and Will Baumol called Global Trade and Competing National Interests, which shows that if the other country is moving ahead technologically, they can destroy your industries. And I think that's what's going on. I remember when President Obama used to talk, we were going to be the leaders in green technology. Anybody think that's going to happen now? No. And so I think that's the context in which what is happening here has to be understood. No one's anti-Chinese. But we certainly have to defend our own people and our own economy. And I salute Chris for putting on a great program like this. Terrific. If China falls at this point, it's going to create a tsunami. <laughs> considering it is the largest trading partner for so many countries, there will be real problems. So nobody is looking out, gunning for China to fall. And that's really not, not the course. What I am bringing up is an issue, and what George and I are bringing up, an issue that we think has been a game changer, an issue that has not been discussed, primarily because academics in the United States look for issues that they have data on. And there is no data on this. And it's important to talk about it and to understand that this has been going on, because it didn't happen by magic. Um, in the very back there. Thank you, Rick from uh, Fairfax. What do you think about a targeting manufacturing help here, like a 15% manufacturing uh, tax credit, something like that, which would probably be more apt to get 60 and 218 in the Congress, as opposed to what we really need, which is comprehensive tax reform, spending reform, legal system reform, regulatory reform. I think one of the things that you need to look at, uh, and this goes way beyond the, the, the scope of the book, but um, one of the things you need to look at is that we can't even agree on what kind of regulatory reform is required. Uh, the idea that all you do is you take, a, you take away the regulators and everything is going to be hunky-dory, that's absolutely wrong. First of all, a lot of the decisions made, uh, especially in the auto industry and some of the other major industries, a lot of the issues, uh, uh, decisions made by the companies run contrary to economic theory. So, for instance, if you look at General Motors, where is their most technologically advanced plant? It's in Shanghai. It's where the labor cost is supposed to be low. 
where uh, in, by economic theory, you should maximize the, the use of labor instead of maximizing the use of capital. So this, uh, the, the idea that uh, you're going to do well, and this is, and I don't know if this is your opinion or not, you're going to do well by just taking the government out of business, it's wrong. You have to bring the government into business and work well with, with uh, between, have a good working relationship between government and business. If you look at the country in the world with the highest trade surplus, it's not China, it's Germany. And you have a very strong relationship between industry and government in Germany. And so that is the strategy which the United States, if it's going to be able to compete successfully in the future, is going to have to move towards. A strong working relationship between government and industry and a strong working relationship between labor and industry. Right now that tends to be falling apart in the U.S. Um, you have uh, other issues that you're going to have to get into uh, Get, get into, and this is this idea that government has to be basically chopped up. One of the worst decisions that has been made in the recent, uh, the, the recent uh, economic problems we've had is the number of teachers that have been fired simply because the government refuses to fund the hiring of teachers and the salaries for teachers. Our kids need to be better educated, not dumbed down. Uh, there has to be, um, and, and at least uh, the municipal governments, at least around the country, have started to recognize this and move, move uh, very strongly in this direction. There has to be much greater investment in our infrastructure. We've literally got a third world infrastructure today, and it's getting worse. Our bridges are collapsing, our highways are falling apart, uh, our, uh, our ports are third class, Many companies, rather than in, the export to the United States through California and, and West Coast Coast, West Coast based ports are now in, exporting to the United States through Mexico and Canada. Vancouver is a much superior port to, to Los Angeles. Why is that? Because we have not invested in, uh, in infrastructure. We have not invested in labor. We have not invested in training of any kind, really. And the idea that, that a country uh, exporting to the United States through Mexico, Mexican ports aren't exactly known for their, for their fantastic performance. And yet it's considered superior to export to the United States through Mexico than to send it into Los Angeles. I mean, this is absurd. We are reaching the point of absurdity in this country. Yep, right here. Hi, I'm Matthew Pologer with the Atlantic Council. I'm just going to switch gears slightly. I just want to say we have no strong opinions on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I was wondering if uh, any of you three could uh, speak to how um, China's uh, either central or periphery governments uh, might change their relationship uh, with their major industries given the ensuing uh, EU-US negotiations uh, with the uh, TTIP uh, free trade agreement that, you know, this is assuming that it will come together and may produce a, you know, a productive free market, and that's a big if, but, you know, uh, how might this sort of rejuvenated relationship across the Atlantic affect Chinese thinking? Thank you. Yes. Some crumpled rose leaves that have come up, including cybersecurity and uh, surveillance and, and a whole bunch of other things that I, I don't really know. I mean, the EU, EU is a much bigger market for China currently than the U.S. is. U.S. demand has been falling, and EU demand has been rising for Chinese products across disproportionately. So... I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not even sure how things are going to be working out in the EU. As you may know, there are 18 trade cases that are going to be <laughs> filed against China or have been in the work somewhere in the East European Commission. And so there is, there, there is the, the European Commission is not a homogeneous entity as either. Um, I'd like to take a pass on that. I don't see how I could answer that question correctly. So if, 
it's, most of it is hypothetical. But would you like to try? <laughs> I think th th there are kind of some serious issues involved. Um, I don't think there's going to be a free trade agreement uh, being generated between the EU, the United States, and China. It's going to be difficult enough getting, uh, for instance, there was the um, d initial discussions, opening discussions on a free trade agreement between the United States and the EU. Um, and then Japan said that they would also like to become involved, and all of a sudden we had Congress people complaining about uh, that nefarious power over in Japan. It's, uh, I think right now if we tried to have a free trade agreement that included China, it would, it would really be torn apart in the, in the Congress, and it just simply would not get passed any way, shape, or form. Um, I do think there is, there is a chance for uh, at least uh, improved trade relations or, uh, with, with the EU and, and Japan. Uh, insofar as maybe not a full tr free trade agreement, but at least partial agreements on certain uh, certain tr industries. Um, I think there there could be a chance um, in the solar industry, for instance, where where we could include China, because there there are talks about uh, a three way agreement on basically resolving the solar uh, solar industry issues and problems uh, between the EU, the United States, and uh, and China. So we, we might see some limited agreements along that line, but a comprehensive tra uh, trade agreement of some kind, it's, it'll be, just be too difficult. Yeah, you want to follow up? Yeah, just a follow up, and I'm sorry, mm -hmm. we can pass on this question as well if you'd like. <laughs> um, I, I don't so much, so much mean a trade agreement involving China. Uh -huh. I mean uh, the, the transatlantic trade and investment yeah. partnership could be viewed as a threat to China. Um, and so, it, you know, it, the dialogue is that it's not going to be excluded, excluding any third parties, except this is going to be a sort of a, mm -hmm. you know, just a, it's going to be between, you know, the US and the EU. So will China add in any way, or what happens when China gets possibly threatened like this? Or, or does it view, these sort of machinations halfway around the world is, is really none of its concern. They would be threatened by it, and, and they will lobby. Uh, there's a well-established practice of lobbying uh, against U.S. free trade agreements. Uh, the Chinese will lobby against this one, just as the Brazilians lobbied against the expansion of NAFTA. I would just add, though, that I, I think to the core of your question, yeah, of course it's putting pressure on China, uh, and they took note of this when, when uh, the U.S. side announced it. And I think to some degree their uh, recent indication of greater interest in TPP may reflect some of this as well. They're worried about being locked out, uh, if you will, of, of that sort of system. Uh, so I think the fundamental answer to your question is yes, uh, they would be worried about it, and they're watching it very closely. As George said, though, I think they're going to do everything they can to continue to play off uh, what they know to be differences between the two sides. Over here in the corner. Anku Natham with John Deere. Uh, just curious if you, any of your work touched upon the strategic emerging industries um, policy, as it were, and where that's going. And if not, any thoughts on how um, overall subsidies and how they're applied ties in with the SCIs? Being with John Deere, I'd love your thoughts on agricultural equipment, but just generally speaking, uh, would be would be uh, interesting too. Well, we have general, and we've done general analysis of how it would be affecting them, but not as specific as to look at which subsidies are going to be affecting them. The Chinese have their own list, you know, strategically important industries that they are also funding, but nothing as tightly as, uh, we haven't analyzed it for as long or as in-depth as we did these five industries. Have you, would you like to say something about that? Insofar as agricultural equipment, I think what you'd find is that uh, there's a, a significant difference between the kind of equipment that, you, that would be needed in China uh, as compared to what is, is sold in the United States or even in Europe although they'd be closer to the European equipment than to the U, uh, U.S. type uh, equipment because simply our equipment is much larger. Well, ours, Canada, Australia, they're much larger 
um, than anything in, in most other countries, at least. Um, also, if you, if you look at the agricultural areas within China, especially in the interior, what you find is that um, they really could not support a Western-style piece of equipment over there. Um, they, would, they would need something that's a, a little bit more rough, a little bit uh, more, uh, less technically advanced, so that they could uh, work on uh, the equipment and repair it uh, uh, locally in the same area rather than have to ship it to the East Coast or to the, the coastal cities for repairs and then shipped back. Um, uh, you also have the issue of the size of the farms, the size of uh, even your collective farms are relatively small by comparison with, with U.S. corporate farms. Uh, so once again, the equipment would be different. If they were to be, uh, uh, to affect U.S. equipment makers as far as especially domestic sales of, of say, John Deere equipment, it would be a, a very precisely targeted uh, export industry that they would be subsidizing and building. Right here in the middle. Hi, uh, Charlie McCarran from IHS. Um, you said one of your main concerns is the development of monop monopolistic pricing power in China as they build out industry, they develop capacity, they force out international competition. But at the same time, doesn't the fragmentation, regionally speaking, and also within industry, prevent such consolidation in pricing power? So you look at, for instance, recently over the last 18 months, China's been experiencing quite severe deflationary pressure of all things. So I'm trying to reconcile these, these two theses that you've presented. I think that's an excellent question. I think that is what the center would like. They would like a consolidation of these industries and so move China from being a price taker to a price maker. But the provinces have their own interests so it's generally moving in that direction. What happens when, say, for example, the solar industry, if the solar industry, let me just say if the solar industry around the world is destroyed and all panel manufacturing occurs in China, I can assure you prices will go up. Okay. But, but will that happen right away, overnight? Will everybody fall in line? I think you can expect that they want to make more money. Somebody there said the Chinese just want to get rich. Yeah, they want to get rich. They don't want to have, you know, be dependent on subsidies. So yes, the prices will go up. This is just an unnaturally low price. Yeah, over here. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Chiu Lin, Chinese Embassy. Uh, I'd like to speak to speak for myself. I have several different views from the professor. I'm the sure. first one is, I think every uh, every enterprise, is, no matter state-owned enterprises or private, big or small, that's still profit-oriented. Uh, only profit orientation can provide sustainability for the uh, for the competitive niche uh, of various various sides of enterprises. Second. I think you emphasize a lot on the scope and even maybe the scale, the scale of, chi of Chinese uh, uh, industries, enterprises, and even Chinese market. Personally, I think competitiveness comes more from quality instead of quantity. Uh, you just, uh, I think China also emphasized a lot on the quality, maybe scale, just a part of the story. My last point is that in the globalized supply chain, in China still, at low end of global supply chain. I think no country can dominate the global supply chain. Thank you. Any response? You can use a more diplomatic response. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, uh, if you go back to, I believe it was Zhu Rongzhi, where he said, grab hold the large and let the small go free. Well, that's what China is trying to do. They're not going to dominate the entire supply chain, but they will want to grab hold of the large, the, the important, most profitable, most technologically beneficial to China elements of that supply chain. And, and so that's what they're trying to do. Um, insofar as quality goes, uh, we would tend to agree with you. Quality is, a, is an extremely important aspect of gaining dominance in an industry. And, and I, one of our, look at one of our slides on the auto parts industry. What you saw is that um, the, uh, the, the investment was, was going up, but the actual uh, uh, 
dollar value of goods being produced was going up even faster. And that's an indication uh, that the Chinese investment is going, uh, is trying to focus on higher value added elements of, of the supply channel, higher value added in elements of the industry. So in, in that respect, you know, we would tend to agree with you, quality is important. The Chinese government recognizes it, and it's trying to move up upstream and into higher quality elements. Um, so uh, in that respect, we have no real disagreement. Uh, the other element that you, that you look at going into the solar industry, for instance, China isn't trying to, do, uh, to dominate the entire solar industry. It's just trying to dominate that element of the, of the solar uh, energy industry, which has the greatest return on investment, which takes the greatest degree of technological, technological skill and knowledge, and has the greatest job multiplier. Uh, of, of any element of the of the solar energy industry. I just want to say here that we think the Chinese are behaving extremely rationally and strategically. We think the rest of the world is not. So <laughs> the Chinese have been, been behaving very rationally. Over for short term rationality. Short term rationality. Yeah. Okay, I think we've got time for one more right here. I, I think it's a similar theme. Uh, Paul Robinson, also IHS, by the way. Um, I think it's a similar theme. Uh, to some of the previous questions, but you mentioned wanting to gain advantages in all these higher value added industries. I, I just don't see how it's possible to gain an advantage in a high value added industry by producing at a loss. Doesn't high value added imply profit? I mean, I guess like I, I like I see your point in terms of moving to higher levels of technology, but you can't ever get there at a loss because you've gotten there at a loss. Mm -hmm. Which is um, you know, value added the value would be added. Okay. profit. No, no, not profit. Not profit. It doesn't. It does not include profit. No. Okay. I would. I would also Please. want to point out one thing. Um, they're not viewing this as as uh, producing at a loss forever, just until they get the dominant position. Then they will start reaping in what they what their profits would be. You're you're looking at profits in the short term. The Chinese are looking at profits in the long term. Although we do think the rationality right now is, is a bit too short term, uh, if they have all of this excess capacity and there is some degree of agreement between the Western countries and they start effectively limiting exports of goods from China, there will be a crash in China which will definitely bring down that government. This excess capacity that's being built up, for example, in the steel industry, where more excess capacity is added every year than the total production of number two produce, producer Japan, just makes no sense. Steel prices keep you know, uh, spinning downward. There is so much excess capacity clogging up the supply chains in China. You can walk through and see that. It doesn't make sense. So it's very, very short-term rationality. And the problem here is that all of these different provinces have their own rationalities, which sometimes don't agree with each other's or with the centers. So it's a short-term rationality with a long-term goal. So that's where you would want to look at it. Is a perfect example, though, where they, they make half of it already and they produce at a loss? I mean, it is, it's either a very unsuccessful or very bad strategy, because they've already re reached 50% level and they're, they're losing money. It's a high-risk strategy is what it is. Uh, they, they are betting their their uh, their government on being able to toe a very fine line and have very uh, very fine controls over what happens. Okay. Well, uh, I think with that, we'll, uh, we're approaching time. Let me just say uh, let me just say a few words in closing. I, I think that today's discussion has demonstrated exactly what I hoped it would. Uh, this is why we have the reality check series here at CSIS is to try to tackle some of these controversial issues. And I really want to thank the audience for being very engaged and, and pushing the speakers. I think that's great. That's exactly what we want to have here at CSIS is a robust debate. And uh, I hope you'll also thank me, uh, join me in thanking the Haley's for their presentation today. Thank you.